we want to welcome all of you to the last of the series. We wanted to have an alum, and we have an alum, class of 1996, who graduated with a degree <laughs> um, that I think offers the kind of skills and abilities that can take you anywhere. It will not confine your dreams. It's really going to let you go. And I think people don't always realize that in the school we have so many different um, majors in the School of Journalism and Communication because they're all different sides of the same story, which is engaging the public. Tia was very active on campus. She was in all phases of extracurricular activities, including the dance club, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, we won't ask you to dance. Please because don't. If you <laughs> see her stand up, she's expecting child number three, but that's more to come. Um, she grew up in North Carolina in Greensboro, but now calls Atlanta home. And I'm sure like many of, your, uh, of our grads, when you come right now, you feel like Chapel Hill is home I because do. this whole town is blooming. I really do. Um, Tia found great success in PR, um, both in the corporate and in public service. Among her jobs was Emory University and um, the world of, w of YMCA for the state of Georgia. Uh, but I think perhaps the most um, important um, moment she had in school was that dreaded 153 class. Because there was a moment when you said, okay, I've been doing all this, but words. Words are really important. They became a halcyon call for Tia as she turned to mom and decided to sort of combine all those dreams into a whole nother career. We're going to explore that. Tia began to write, and she found her writing resonated with many others. She now has seven books on her shelf. The last of which is, I love the title, If These Shoes Could Talk, Devotional Messages for a Woman's Daily Walk. Um, we have much to talk about with Tia and joining us for really a conversation because that's become our moment. We have Trevi McDonald's who has also been in the e-book business and can tell something about that. She of course is one of our professors in the J School and I think Trevi has had a year that she will remember. She has not only won one grant, she's won two grants to move her work and her scholarship forward. She is um, interviewing the black reporters who covered the March on Washington and she recently just uh, interviewed one who is 94 years old so this is important work to do before it's too late to do that but she's expanded beyond to other members of the war of the March in Washington um, and our student interviewer today um, is Alexis Simmons she is a uh, as we say a rising junior at this time of the year from South Carolina and came with an, uh, a desire to follow electronic journalism and we've already been giving her um, tips on what she should uh, pursue um, she is a uh, part of the staff at the North Carolina Scholastic Media Association offices where everybody wants to steal her because she is so <laughs> powerful and she also is a writer for the Blue and White Campus Max, uh, Magazine. Um, we're proud because she is an alum of the Chuck Stone program and we try to get uh, those Chuck, Chuck Stone alums into the school and this summer she'll be back in Charleston, South Carolina at the NBC affiliate news station WCBD TV to begin her internship. So I want I get to start as okay. a moderator um, uh, with the first question, and and it's sort of a you know a, a simple one, um, but a big one because you've taken some other turns. Um, but tell us what it was like when you um, you came in here and and came into the journalism school and then made PR uh, your um, you know your major. But I don't want you to talk to us about that moment. I want to talk to us about being a senior at this moment when it was sort of the end and coming to a graduation and what you were anticipating and how you saw yourself then and in a way you've changed but remember back to that moment and share with us sort of that a little bit of that journey okay. from leaving here and thinking okay. about who you were. Okay, um, when I look back to who um, I was you know, when you're saying you have big expectations of what your life is going to be, you, know, you think you have it all planned out. And when I actually first started journalism school, I had plans to be a broadcast journalist. You know, I wanted to do that whole thing. And I ended up going to a mentorship and they sent me to CNN Atlanta. And I spent the day with a producer and they, you know, hopped me around to other different departments. And what happened is at the end of the day, I realized that's not what I wanted to do. Um, part of it was because I was walking down the hall with the lady I was assigned to and she just kind of said hello to this man as he was walking by like, hey, how you doing? See you tonight. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. And she was <laughs> like, oh, that's my husband. But we never get to see each other. 
And in my mind, in my heart, even though, you know, I was just a college student, I knew that that wasn't the life that I wanted. You know, just to kind of see your husband in passing. You know, when you're married, sometimes you wish that's the case. But <laughs> in the big scheme of things, that's not the desire that I had for myself. And she was saying, oh, you know, I think she was really being truthful and honest with me. when she was like, it's really hard to have children in this business because in, she, she lived such a fast-paced life. And I said, you know what, I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina. You know, I was so ready to come, get out of North Carolina for whatever reason. Now I do want to come back. But um, that just wasn't the story that I wanted for my life. And so I decided to just kind of switch it up. I ended up working at the um, Ronald McDonald House of Chapel Hill and really enjoyed myself. And from that point on, I said, OK, you know, let's try this, this track. Well, I think the great thing about the journalism school is that it equips you for so many different options for your life. Um, and you come out and you say, you know what, I have so many paths that I can take that if I want to switch up and try down this, this road, that's fine. If that doesn't work, I can come back and start over again. And um, I was telling them earlier at lunch, even though I found out also who I was kind of at this journalism school, I also found out who I wasn't. Mm. Um, and I think that was, that was very important for me. That's the, uh, and who weren't you? I wasn't the kind who wanted to, li I thought I wanted to live in front, be in front of the camera, and I realized that I didn't. Um, I found out that I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm trying to use that. Um, I found out that I'm not as, um, I'm trying to see how I can say this. I'm not as, um, well, at that time, I wasn't as driven as I should have been. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I realized and that I regret, you know, you say you never want to regret anything, but one of the things I realized is that when I was at the journalism school, I didn't maximize all my opportunities. And so I had to kind of get that drive. You know, some people are born with drive. Some people develop a, a, a certain drive. So I found out that I wasn't as driven as I thought because when you come from, you know, it's coming from a smaller city and you're entering um, kind of like a world where everyone is not like you, but everyone is a high achiever. You know, everyone um, achieves certain things, you know. So you're coming to the world where you might have been the quote unquote smartest, and now you're entering into the world where everyone's the smartest. So we'll pursue that a little bit more. You haven't mentioned the word entrepreneur yet, but right. you're clearly an entrepreneur. But you get to ask the next question, Trevor. Uh, you started out your career in public relations. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about that moment when you made the decision to write your first novel okay. and how that unfolded and everything aligned for you to bring it to completion. Okay, um, I think the moment I made the decision, it was in 1999 of May, and I was actually laid off from a position. And there's something about being laid off where you have nothing to do but sit and think about the choices you made, you should have made, you should have done. So, you know, they're basically so many episodes of Judge Mathis a person can watch in one day. And <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, I, it, it began to be for me more of a pursuit of purpose and a pursuit of passion. Because for me, it was so simple for someone to come in and say, okay, you no longer have a job right now. And then you almost, it's like you lose your joy. So what was that thing that would give me joy whether I had a job or not. Like I never wanted someone to have that much power over me that they could, you know, take away my job and I felt like I had nothing. And so um for many people it's their identity. Right. right. And then they right. were dropped. Right. And so um I've I've always been a voracious reader. I loved reading novels. I love making up, you know, stories. I can sit here and I can make up stories about any of you all in this room. Of course, they won't be accurate, but you know, just the way you sit, just the way you look, just the way you talk, I can totally fabricate. People, I, I can just make up lies about you. <laughs> and so I found it's out like fiction. that. Right, exactly. So the good thing about it is I can lie and get paid for it now. Um, so I just begin to see, I'm like, you know, what do I love to do? And I love to read and I love to write. And it's just like those two things got married, even though I did end up going back into the corporate world. Um, because it's not like you make these millions of dollars getting into the book business. But I never lost that passion. At least I knew from that point on, you know, I can take this money at this job and use it to fund my future dreams. Hmm. But that's yeah. not easy, finding a publisher and that kind of thing. How did you do that? No, you know, I think it's a matter of preparation, meeting opportunity. Um, because I had been writing on my novel for several years, and I would start and stop and start and stop. And the crazy thing about it is I went to Walmart. You know, this is a crazy story. I went to Walmart, and I was shopping. And I had my, um, you know, back then we had agendas. 
and I had my little agenda open with my, you know, little list of um, things I need to buy from Walmart, I bent down to get some detergent, and when I bent back up, my agenda was gone. Someone had stolen it from me, and in that agenda was my disc, you know, back in the day you had the little square disc, was my disc with the book I had been writing on it. And so, you know, of course, I'm running around, running around trying to find this, and I'm asking the store manager. He's over there, you know, trying to flirt with the lady in the department. I'm like, no, my disc is gone. <laughs> you know, but the great thing about it is, for whatever reason, I had printed it, the whole manuscript out like two months before. So I had it, but it's just the fact that I thought someone has walked away with my dream. And my friend was like, believe me, if they're stealing your stuff, they're not interested in that dream. You know, that's not the kind of person. So three months later, the manager, I had left my name and number on the back of a little receipt and I discounted it as a loss. And three months later they called and they said, you know, you, they found my agenda. I went up there, everything was still intact. And wow. it was like from then it was like, okay, so what are you gonna do? Are you just gonna sit here and do nothing? Or you, cause you have the ability to, to end your own dream. Or are you gonna keep pursuing after that? And you pursued? I kept pursuing, yes, I kept pursuing. And um, that was in about, about 2001, 2000, Two, and then I learned about a, um, a expo called Book Expo America that they have every year. And this particular year is going to be in LA. And one of my um, great girlfriends, her her sister lived in LA, and we decided to make it a trip on Memorial Day. And I got all my information together. I got my proposal done. You know, I did the re necessary research, and I just went in there, you know, like a bulldog, meeting as many editors as I could, meeting as many publishers as I could, and. When I got back, I submitted to several publishing houses, and that was in June when I did the submissions, and by November of that year, I had signed a book deal. Okay, that's pretty inspiring. <laughs> I'd almost lose my agenda book at Walmart for that. <laughs> but it does feel sort of cosmic and sort right. of guardian angel-like, right. and like a moment to sort of say, okay, look yourself in the mirror and decide right. what you want. Right. Don't okay. just keep going around. Alexis, okay, you, uh, yeah. you get to ask the next Okay, um, I just feel like us as college students can totally relate to your journey, as in you deciding to do one thing and finding your passion for another thing. And I just wanted to know, what motivational advice would you give to the college students who are entering this unpredictable job market, not knowing what's gonna happen? Um, you know, you're a woman of God, you have motivational talks. I just wanna know, like, what um, positive things that you would give us to um, ensure that we can, you know, stay strong in the midst of this job search. Right. Um, one of the things I would say is you have to be flexible. I know sometimes we come in with a one-track mind and just say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to be this broadcast journalist, and and then life happens, and nothing. I think things rarely turn out the way you want them to turn. So I would say be flexible, um, be open to your options, do your job, and do your job well. And like I was saying, I didn't have that kind of commitment and, and motivation and drive that I needed, but those are things that you can certainly develop. Um, so I think if you stay um, focused and stay committed and just keep going, you know, you can't stop. You really don't have an option to stop. So if you don't see a way, you make a way. We have, um, in my household, my husband always says, um, we don't make excuses, we make a way. You know, and that's something I get tired mm -hmm. of hearing, but it's true, you know, we don't make excuses, we make a way. So if you don't see the job, that you want, you create the job that you want. You know, so do your job and do it well and doors will definitely begin to open up for you. But when they're just starting out, mm -hmm. you know, they're gonna see probably more mm -hmm. doors closing or something right. and then they get down. Right. So, so how, I mean, how do they make their way? I right. mean, you went by starting to write. Right, and, and, and also I don't think, there's nothing wrong with starting at the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, people think you're gonna come in and you, you're gonna start at the top, it's nothing wrong with starting at the bottom. At least you have, you have some way, somewhere to go, <laughs> you know, as opposed to being at the top, you can fall back down easy. So I just think if you, you know, come in with, um, I don't want to say even lower your expectations, but come in, you know, just have a reasonable expectation of, you know, where you are and it's a journey. So at least if you see something ahead of you, you know where you're working towards, but you don't have to start at the top. That way you're always working to, you know, to go higher. Mm -hmm. And we give a lot of opportunities to our seniors to get, <laughs> look at you got a summer job this summer, mm -hmm. which is going to start to craft a career for mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. Was it your drive that got it? It definitely was. Um, I would say just kind of 
over spring break, you know, I went out there and I like called the news stations. I was like, hi, hey, I'm here for spring break. Um, I'm not going to be home. I'm in Chapel Hill. Can I come in and drop my application off? Um, I did that and, you know, that opened the door for an interview right there and then. So I think that the whole thing, what you were saying, just, you know, just kind of do what you can. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely good advice, you know. Right. And, and I think people will find, people will seek you out. You know, you never want to burn those bridges because there's, you know, you can always go back to those people, whether it's them giving you um, a reference or if they know of a job opportunity, then they'll call you and say you don't have the, the perfect person. So I think you can definitely make room and make way for yourself. Let's talk about the reality of, um, and, and I'm not sure exactly what that moment, but you're, you bring your book around. Were you married at that moment? Yes. Um, <laughs> it was but you weren't bringing lots of money home, probably. Oh, oh no, I wasn't at all. <laughs> but, um, but also, and it was so funny because I told my husband, well, it was my fiance at the time, I'm like, look, if you don't marry me by this date, your name is not going to be on this book because, it's <laughs> <laughs> because if we're not married by the time this book comes out, I'm keeping my maiden name as my pen name, so you will never oh. find fame and fortune. <laughs> 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 no, I'm serious. This is really what the conversation was. Um, <laughs> and so we, we, got, we were engaged in June. Um, I was in June of 2004. I was married in November 2004, and the book came out in January 2005. Wow. So, you know, I'm like, okay, you have, you know, January 1st is the deadline. <laughs> you know, I actually had the, the book cover mock up and it had my maiden name on it. And I think he looked at it like, oh, she's serious. I'm like, no, I'm serious. <laughs> so you really are driven as a woman. You know what you want and you, you, you set a few deadlines. <laughs> right. Not to say he follows all of them, but that one, <laughs> that one happened to work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so that was different. And I was also still working at the time. You know, I didn't just jump ship. Um, because it takes a while to build a career, even now, you know, mm -hmm. it's still building, you know, you just, like a brick, you just keep building, but um, it definitely helps when you have someone who's supportive and who believes in your dream as much as, if not more, than you do. Yeah. There's a saying in the literary world that writing the book is the easy part. Mm -hmm. Selling it is the harder part. What, in what ways did your education at the journalism school prepare you for that journey? Mm -hmm. Um, I think becoming a people person helped prepare me for the journey um, because, you know, when you're a journalist, you kind of dig behind the story. You know, you dig behind the front of the story and, and see who the people are, you know, behind it. So I think just being a, uh, in public relations and having those skills and having the internships, I think that was, that was a huge help because um, I'm not naturally a shy person anyway, but you know, just knowing how to relate to people, how to relate to different kinds of people um, was definitely an asset because you're, like, a, like you said, it is easier to write the book. When you're writing it, you don't think so, but it's easy, you know, once it's on the shelf, it's nothing if someone doesn't walk away with it. So being a people person, definitely. Yes, um, another question I had was, um, who are some of your role models that, you, that you've seeked inspiration from? Hmm. I would say currently, and I think depending on um, my stage in life, my role models have changed and shifted. Yeah. Tell, tell me. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, because when you have different mindsets when you're at different seasons. You know, you have a mindset of, you know, being this go-getter, I'm going to do this, you know, no matter what. Um, I want my career to go this way. So you look for women, at, at my time I was looking for women who were single women, you know, who were doing their thing. And then as you add one baby, you're like, okay, I cannot do all this and have a baby. So you tend to seek for people who are having that balancing act of having a husband, um, a family, a career, children. And I think right now, even though she happens to be single, um, one of my biggest inspirations is a woman by the name of Valerie Burton. Mm -hmm. Um, she was actually on the Today Show not too long ago just because she teaches life skills and, you know, she's kind of a motivator. She teaches to you about getting unstuck, being unstuck, and being unstoppable. Mm -hmm. So I would say right now that's um, one of my biggest inspirations. She's one of my biggest inspirations. Great. Talk a little bit about when you did have your first child mm -hmm. then and how you decided to balance. Because you made it clear. You're walking in your earliest days, going through mm -hmm. CNN, and said, mm -hmm. I don't want to be this sort of passing in the night. Right. Um, and then... I think the question so many women have is how do I have this career and my ambitions and mm -hmm. my satisfaction and yet I want to be there for my child too. Right. So talk a little bit right. about how you dealt with that. Yeah, I mean even after I had my child, um, it was still an awakening and I'll say a rude awakening um, because there's so much behind having a child that, you, that I didn't expect 
And after I had my son, I decided not to return to Emory University. And I said, well, okay, my husband said, if you're ready to do it, you know, I'm ready to do it. We went out and had this big dinner. I'm like, okay, let's clink glasses. You know, it's on now. And I said, I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom, and I'm going to be a full-time writer. But in reality, I was a full-time mom and a write-when-you-can writer. <laughs> you know, I never got anything done because I'm thinking, oh, he's little. How much is it going to take? What? You know, someone should have slapped me and woke me up then. Um, so, and, and each, and then with my next daughter, you know, with my daughter, it was like, okay, we're starting this process over again. But I think it gets easier to handle when you have a network of people, a community that helps you. You know, when you have expectations, you know, there's certain things that my husband knows, you know, that he does. We're a team. So when you have that team that helps you, and like you said, you're all moving in the, you know, the same direction. I mean, that, that's, that's, it's a huge help. And, um, and there are sometimes just as a mother, or just as a parent, you just sacrifice things. That's part of life. You know, that's, that's part of a job. And, you know, sometimes it's funny because sometimes when we would do, you know, we do our budget for the month and me and my husband will look at it and he's like, you know how much you would be making had you stayed at Emory. You know, little <laughs> things like that. It's just, it's just a joke. But um, you look at the sacrifices and say, okay, the, the, the time for my children is the investment that I'm making at this season. And it's gotten easier now. Uh, got pregnant, you know, surprise for me. So I'm basically, you know, starting over again. But, you know, you just go through seasons and you just take it and keep rolling, you know, so. But you make choices too, right? You, yeah, you make choices. You, you definitely have choices to make. Um, and we, I try to make choices looking ahead. You know, you can get so caught up and, and so overwhelmed and, and um, but you just have to look at what you think is, what you think is most important. You know, I would send my daughter and my son when they weren't in school, I would take that time and say, you know what, we're not, we don't need that new car. You know, I'd rather take that money and send them to daycare. You know, we'll drive the older car. So you, you, small choices like that that you think would never, um, you wouldn't have to think about. So sort, suddenly you're thinking about that. You know, I wanted to go back into public relations and the career that I was looking at, the job I was looking at, it would require travel. So that wasn't gonna work for me. You know, it would require long hours. I was on a leash, you know, I was always getting paged, come meet this doctor for this interview. That wasn't gonna work for me. So, you know, you walk away and say, okay, that's not for me for right now. Jackie. What's the most memorable experience you've had out on the road as an author? Um, doing literary events or book signings. I know sometimes when we do book signings, we might mm -hmm. not move a lot of books right. that day, but we'll have that, you know, the most aha memorable moment. memorable experience. Hmm. It's hard to do that work, isn't it? It is. It's hard. it's hard because you never know what to expect. Like I was saying before, sometimes you can plan an event, and I've gone and I've, I've expected like 50 people, and I walk in, it's like 500 people. Or you walk in expecting thing. 500 people and it's like five, you're like, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but you, you definitely, you have, you have to really put yourself out there. Um, I think, and I don't know why this stands out for me. I was in um, Victoria, Texas in 2011 and I was at an event and it was a room about this size and there was one lady, it was a group of authors, and there was one lady, she slept during the whole entire thing. I mean, she was like, you know, I'm like, okay, great, this is really great. So you try not to look at the person who's dozing <laughs> the whole time. And so um, at the end, they did a, a huge, you know, they had people answering questions. I mean, this lady slept through the whole thing. And at the end, they were make, doing drawings. You can win like a set of books for all the authors there. Did you know she won the books? I'm thinking, <laughs> I sleep the entire time. But it's kind of like, hey, if it's for you, it's for you. You know, sooner or later, you're going to wake up. <laughs> Or whatever. So I don't know why that sticks out for me, but you know. it's definitely don't unforgettable. Sleep. Right. <laughs> Wake up. You never know when your opportunity is gonna. Is What's gonna been come. the toughest one for you, Trevi? Ah, uh, let's see. Or I memorable. remember um, when I first started out, I uh, did a book signing at a Barnes and Nobles in downtown Chicago. The leader of the book club loved my book. And then I went to the meeting, and I had just happened to have a friend of mine, Marina Woods, with me. And oh, yeah. One person in the meeting said that they didn't like my book, and then everybody else kind of agreed with them, and I kind of had to sit there <laughs> through that. <laughs> and then my friends started asking them questions, and um, it was reaffirming to me because they were, you know, just a little um, contradictory in terms of 
you know, I had too much details, but the characters weren't developed well enough, which, you know, kind of didn't go hand in hand. Yeah. And you can't please, that's the thing, you know, you have this work and all of a sudden it's in the public eye. And most people's work is not like that. It's not scrutinized, it's not torn apart. And I've had that same thing, you know, you can walk in, you know, you're like trying to be chipper, trying to be yourself, and somebody's like, I didn't like it. You know, and I'm thinking, well, that's rude. I wouldn't come to your job and say you didn't do, <laughs> you didn't do a good job. You know, especially, but they think, okay, well, you've put yourself out there, you know, for this kind of critique. So, you know, you're definitely just not going to please everyone. So um, you just do it and, and take your thick, you know, have a thick skin and, and just keep moving forward. So for every one person who doesn't <laughs> like it, there's like 20 who does. So Who love it. Yeah, love <laughs> it. Mm -hmm. And does that what keep both of you writing, the, those people who love it? What, or is it just because you have to do it? I think I have to do it. And the, and the readers will bug you anyway if you don't. You know, I get emails all the time, when's the next book, when's the next mm -hmm. book coming out, when's the next book coming out? You know, they'll take it and they'll read it in two days, but it took me a year to write. I'm like, well, I'm still working on another one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but I think that, that desire for them to, because they become so engaged with the characters. And um, in my first book, A Heart of Devotion, there was a, two characters named um, Tyson, a character named Tyson and Sherry. And they're like, well, what's happening with them? I'm like, I don't know, they're not even real. You know, I, maybe, I don't know what they're doing. You know, they're doing whatever was on the last page of the book. Um, so I definitely think that keeps me writing as well. Alexis. And um, that leads me to my next question. Um, people, like when you have this idea to write a book, I feel like I have an idea, like I want to write a book myself, but how do you begin that process? Like where do you start? Um, just of having to having to publish a book, like do you start with the main idea? Do you start with like the beginning? Just, uh, just some. You start at the computer, <laughs> <laughs> and I know that sounds crazy, but there are so many people who want to write a book, but they never actually sit down and write it. You know, and that's how I was. Oh, I'm going to write a book one day. I'm going to write a book one day, and sooner or later, you'll get tired of hearing yourself say it. So I, I don't think there's one magic formula for mm -hmm. it because some people will outline and map out the whole entire book and then write and. You know, for me, I'll start writing because I just have to get the story started. And then about chapter seven or eight, then I'll start, you know, fleshing out. I always know the end. Mm -hmm. I always know the beginning and the mm -hmm. end. I just have to figure out how to get there without climaxing on four, page 40. You mm -hmm. know, because it's really easy to start a book, but it's really hard to finish one because mm -hmm. you have to keep a reader engaged from page one to page, you know, 230 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, Do you have any particular rituals with writing or are they specific for different projects? Um, no, well, one thing I do every time when it's time for me to write is I clean up because I don't like seeing clutter because I feel like if I see clutter, I can't think. And then it also gives me an excuse for my husband. You know I have to write. And so he helps me clean up. <laughs> so, you know, that's an excuse. But I do clean up every time before I get right, um, started writing. And um, I try to go to the um, library, but then that disrupts my writing process because you have, when you have to, you know, go to the restroom or go get a snack, you have to pack up everything and, you know, go back home. So I, I typically stay home. Right now I've just been staying home and trying not to start another load of laundry, not to put something in the crock pot, you know. But I can write with noise, with just background noise. I can write with the kids screaming because, you know, you just kind of tune them out. You know, after a while you don't even hear them um, unless the fire alarm goes off or something like that. But, um, yeah, if I clean up, then I think a lot better. And how has the e-world of books been? Has it given more opportunity to oh, it's you? Oh, de it's definitely, it's definitely opened up more opportunities. Um, this book that I had, The Devotion, that you said, that was my first nonfiction project. Everything else has been a novel. And um, I did it as an e-book as well as a paperback. And people read e-books um, very quickly and they purchase them a lot more than I think even traditional books now because even when I go to book club meetings now people just come with their Kindles and their iPads you know there's really very few books to sign <laughs> because they just come with you know their iPads and they'll say well can you sign a bookmark for me or they have something new called Kindle graph I believe where you can like sign on it and it'll capture your oh. um, your your autograph but very few people come with um with actual books in hand anymore, and I find my I found myself I said I will never, you know, get wrapped up in the ebook thing. I want my books like the feel of the pages, like to turn the page, 
And what happened to me is I read my first ebook. I'm like, oh, I read it so much faster. I don't know why, but I read faster when I'm reading it, like on my mm -hmm. iPad, for whatever reason. You can read in the dark, too. Yeah, you can read in the dark, right. It. But don't you have to market it? I mean, share with folks, you know, how you market the books. They're not sitting there in the, in the little bookstore or something. It's right. like. Right. But see, this, the world for, to me has moved from brick and mortar to click and order. So even if people are going into the bookstores, the only thing they do is go into the bookstores to find what they're going to go back and order online anyway. You know, so they find the deals or they find what they want and they go back and order it on the line. So from brick and mortar to click and order. So social media and everything, you know, that's good and bad about it, social media really moves books. You've experienced that too, right, Trevi? Yes. But you have to, so now here's the PR skills coming back. <laughs> exactly, right. exactly. Right? And that's one thing I found very early as on my journey. I started out as a self-published author. Mm -hmm. And all of the skills that I had as a communication major just kind of came back to me at once. And I, I published my book in 1999 before the whole ebook phenomenon and was able to get it into uh, black bookstores around the country, mm -hmm. a couple of in England and in the Caribbean in like a week just mm -hmm. from using those skills. Right. And how's the finances on that? Because you're saying they're ordering them faster. Do you do this author? You, I, I, as an author, I believe you be, um, feel, feel the residuals coming in faster, Absolutely. especially when you're self-published. Because with a traditional publisher, depending on um, what your contract says, you could just really be getting like a dollar. But once, they, once, you're adva once you've you know, recouped, they've recouped your advance and you're earning royalties, it could be like a dollar a book, as opposed to if you've self-published an e-book and put it out there, and let's say it's four ninety nine, five ninety nine. And you know, Amazon takes this little cut. You're getting five dollars a book as opposed yeah. to a buck. You know, a yeah. buck, and that's just the way the world is moving. You it, definitely feel it faster, I think. And just to piggyback on what Tia said, my self-published print book, Amazon got fifty five percent. Plus, I had to pay to ship it to them. I had to pay to have it printed. With the ebook, I get 70%. Right. Wow. And Amazon pays every month versus the book distributors where the business is 90 day net and they might hold your money in case they get right. returns. Right. And with publishers, you get paid twice a year. Right. So that's why you should have multiple contracts so you can, you know, kind of keep the money flowing. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge difference. This is why we're teaching business and entrepreneurial skills, in case you were wondering <laughs> here at the School of Journalism. Uh -huh. Does this attract you? What is it? Or does this seem it's, like a world beyond it's, you? It's really inspiring, actually. Um, I've come to find that I don't know what my path is going to lead me to, and I shouldn't be scared to know that I can go into something totally different than I plan. So it's definitely like reassuring to know that, like, I don't know, my destiny is not planned, but it could just kind of lead me anywhere. Right. So, right. Yeah. And you can, you can be going to um, medical journalism or, you know, you're in the finance side, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you become the expert in that area, and now you've written an e-book on, you know, finances for college students or finances for stay-at-home moms. And you know, you've taken that degree, you've taken that experience and recreated it and you know, created an opportunity for yourself. And is that important? Is that what you want people like Les to know, to create yes. those opportunities? Create them and, and keep multiple streams. You know, I, that's one thing I found out when being laid off, if you, you should have multiple streams of income. If one brook dries up, you have another one that's flowing. Mm -hmm. That's what we are trying to tell you, mm -hmm. students. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, really, that, but the skills of being able to write and communicate are going right. to serve you in whatever field right. you want. Right. Mm -hmm. What about, um, I was taken by the phrase you used, woman of God, is that how mm -hmm. you said it? Mm -hmm. Has that been a key piece of your success and, and your writing? How, yeah, I think my faith is definitely the foundation. Definitely the foundation. I always tell people when they say, well, who do you write for? Of course I write for my um, audience, but I'm like, there are three people I never want to disappoint. Number one, that is God. Number two, that is my grandmother because she's 85 this year and she reads every book I write. <laughs> <laughs> and number three is my children. I never want to write anything that my children will pick up later and be embarrassed. I would never do that. Never do that. And it's not to say that um, just because I write in a certain genre that, you know, everything is clean, everything is squeaky, and these people are perfect, but I would never embarrass my children in that way. Because, I mean, books, even though they go through different forms, you know, their paper, um, paperback, you know, their audio, their ebooks, who knows what they will be next, they live on. You know, you'll always be able to find the written words somewhere. So those are three people I never want to let down. Speaking, Pretty important audience. Yeah. Speaking of writing, do you get writer's block and how do you overcome it? Um, 
I think when I get writer's block, it's because I have not sat down at the computer and just started writing. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can say, oh, I don't have any ideas, but it's amazing what ideas will come. If you just sit down and start writing about your day, and if you go into, well, Starbucks or whatever, like I said, I can look at anybody and just start making up a story about them. So just sitting and writing a story about someone who's walking by, it kind of awakens your muse, you know. So um, I think the act of writing helps you get over the writer's block. And just, you don't have to write it right the first time. You know, the, the joy of being an author is that you have edits. Like when a brain surgeon goes in, you've got one chance to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but this one, you can go in and you go back in and you go back in. You keep reworking it until it's exactly like you want it. And so it does prove you do need mm -hmm. to edit. You don't just do the first draft. <laughs> oh, no, you do. And then, like, I go through, um, well, with a novel, it's a little different because you have so many things you have to look for. You have to make sure the dialogue is realistic. So I read my dialogue aloud. Um, when there's a man talking, I, t you know, read it to my husband because I'm just a, a woman trying to write like a man, but I don't want it to seem like it's a man and a woman speaking like a woman. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I have to run those things by. And so I read it once for dialogue. You read it for grammar. You read it for you know consistency. You can't have the character at the beginning of the novel in shorts, and then at the end of the chapter he's wearing a wool sweater. You know, you read it for description. You know, you read it for the senses. So if you just go back and read it like almost seven times, and I know someone who reads their novel backwards, so they can just read page by. I'm not doing all that, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a little too much for me. But it seems to help them because they're forced to read each line as opposed to, you know how you just skim and yeah. you're forced to read each line that way. It takes discipline. It does. It yeah. really does. Alexis? A lot of the things that you were saying about your book took me back to the 153 class with the consistency and the different journalism aspects. Would you say that your journalism background has prepped you to become the great author that you are? I, yeah, of course I would. <laughs> <laughs> take the credit. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think. But it also, um, when you read other things, you know, I, had, I have to, when I'm reading a book, I say, okay, Tia, read this is strictly for entertainment because you'll find yourself, mm -hmm. like, wanting to put a, like, that's not a semicolon right there. You know, mm -hmm. you'll find yourself wanting to edit as, um, as opposed to read, but I think all of it, in the grand scheme of things, everything works together. Mm -hmm. It really does. So I promised that I would go out into the audience to ask a question. Um, who's got it? Queenie. Question about the cover and the significance of stiletto heels in your book cover. Is there well, the the book um, the publisher actually designed the cover. Oh, okay. Um, because we have a traditional publisher, most of the time you are just, you can kind of give your input, but they make the final decision. But there are three things that I um, told the publisher when this particular book, these particular books were coming out. And I told them there are three things that move novels. One is the title, which I'm responsible for. One is the content, which I'm responsible for. The next one is the cover, which they are responsible for. Because a lot of people will pick up the book just by its cover. And I found that women love shoes. And so I'm like, well, you know what? Let's put some shoes on it. And people will stop and pick it up just because it has shoes. And I would leave little, um, leave bookmarks and book, and, and, um, book um, postcards. I would leave them like in shoe stores Ooh, and things like idea. that. You know, just little innovative things. Like, okay, well, I'll put this in the drive. Wherever a woman would be, nail shops. I'm like, oh, let me stick a couple of these in the People <laughs> magazine. You know, and, um, it was so funny. I had stuck, I think I was, I, don't remember, I think I might have been at a um, bookstore. And you know how you're just walking by and subscription cards? I'm like, oh, I just randomly picked one and just stuck it down in there. And someone was like, oh, you're just doing such a great job. It must be so phenomenal to have an insert in people. I'm like, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's great. I'm like, yeah, I put that in there. You know, just random. You know, but someone emails me. I'm like, yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> you know. Creative marketing, you know, so. <laughs> I hope we taught you a few of those tricks, but for, for the record, because they can't see you in, probably on, um, um, she's got stilettos on. <laughs> well, I do have my flat shoes. You do, too, but <laughs> you like shoes. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're all right. <laughs> I'd love for you to talk about perseverance, because it is like running a marathon to write a book. How do you keep yourself on task? Because there's a lot of discipline involved. Right. Um, I, I give myself a daily goal or at least a weekly goal because sometimes with kids, with me, you never know what's going to happen for the week. So, um, for instance, 
this project that I'm working on now, I know that I need to write 1,575 words per day if I'm writing seven days a week to reach my goal, okay? But if I only write five days a week, I have to write 1,125. And I know that seems like, what in the world? But just having that goal for me says, okay, T, and my husband's like, well, did you meet your goal? I'm like, get out, I have 200 more words. Because for me, it's just the act of getting it done. Like I was saying, the first draft does not have to be perfect. It just has to be disciplined. I mean, it just has to be finished. You don't have anything to edit if you have empty pages. If you have blank pages, there's nothing to do. And so you can get overwhelmed by, oh, this novel should be 283 pages. You have to look at, okay, I'm writing two pages today. And you have to pick the time that works best for you. I'll write best in the morning. Um, by the evening, I'm zonked. I can't focus. You know, the kids are screaming in this way. And, and I fall asleep. I've always fallen asleep early. You know, I'm not a late night person, but I am an early morning person. And when I was working full time, I took my lunch. I said, okay, I'm not going down. And when I worked at Emory, I'm like, I'm not going down to that student hall buying dinner or buying lunch. I'm going to bring my lunch and sit in the car and write. And I did whatever I needed to do. Even I was writing, you know, longhand. Um, and I had a, for Atlanta traffic, I had a little, you know, what do you call it now? Digital voice yeah, recorder. Yeah, voice recorder. And I would just ride and talk to myself. I'm like, I know these people think I'm crazy, but, <laughs> you know, I'm on a mission. So I think giving yourself a goal really helps. And I have an accountability partner, um, and we'll text each other. Um, are you sitting down now, or are you, you know, making dinner? And, you know, I could be making dinner. I'm like, oh, I'm sitting down, you know, so you go. and and um, find, the, find your goal and find your accountability partner, for sure. What is an accountability partner? So Some, someone who believes in your dreams, someone who will keep you on task. Um, my person happens to be another writer, so she kind of knows, you know, we've been writing together for a while, so she knows me, but it doesn't have to be, you know, right? It's just someone who will keep you focused, doing what you're supposed to do. Yes? Um, how has the message of your books changed over time, and is there Good question. any I don't think my message has changed. I think I've, I've evolved as a writer. You know, I think I'm a better writer from my last book than I was from my first one. But for me, my message has really stayed um, consistent um, because I write books that are books of faith. I write books that are for women of faith. So my faith message doesn't change because for me, my Bible doesn't change. Um, so I have grown from writing my books because you put these people in these these imperfect people in these imperfect situations and see how they're gonna handle it. Um, and I think for me, my message is, you know, wherever you are in your faith, in your faith walk, you can continue to get better. Like it's, today is not necessarily the end. You know, if you mess up today, you know, you can start over tomorrow. I just try to give messages of hope, messages of inspiration for imperfect people, you know, who are just trying to, trying to get it right. So my message hasn't changed, but I think the way I deliver it might have changed. You get to solve people's problems before they even, you know, get too <laughs> right. far, right? Because yeah. you get into that next chapter. Yeah. I have a, kind of a speculative, speculative question for you. Uh, okay. What advice would you have for someone like me who's a single mother and mm -hmm. who would like to find a work-life balance that I don't have the same type of network that you have? Mm -hmm. What would you, could you imagine yourself in that situation or what would you advise, you know, hmm. To, to try to find that balance, but still be able to meet your right. goals. Right. Hmm. And you say you don't have a network, meaning you don't I'm have. Not like you. I mean, you, you rely on your husband, and you said you have an extended family and friend network. Right. Well, for me, when we first started, um, when I first started writing, V had started an online writing group of people who were in my area. So when there wasn't a, a network there, we created one. Um, these, all these people happened to be women of faith who were writing like Christian fiction was the genre. It didn't have to be Christian, it could just be inspirational. So we connected in that way and that's, those are the ways you find your people um, who you can walk with and the majority of those women, not all of them were married, because people come from so many different backgrounds who still have the same, you know, they have the same, some of the same goals. You know, we know we wanted to be published, but there was um, a mother who had heart disease uh, and she was a single mother. There was a woman who had two children, um, and she was a single mother. And there were those of us who were married and, you know, had little babies. So when we came, we would come and bring our children. You know, we would go to different houses and say, okay, everybody bring something. 
bring the kids, we'll let them play, we'll write, we'll let them play, we'll critique. So I think you can start creating, and you know, it's amazing what you would do if you put out a Facebook post or put out a tweet. Anybody in the Durham area who's interested in writing, put flyers up at the library, people really will really respond. I think they really will respond. But you need a network is what you're I, you saying. Def yeah, because like I said, the people will keep you on track, they will hold you accountable because writing is a very solitary life. You know, even though I was in public relations and I get a chance to travel and talk to people, when I'm writing the book, it's only me and these little characters that live in my head. You know, so I'm the only person. So you have to have those people who can, you know, keep moving you forward. In the back of the room was a woman I was going to introduce to start, <laughs> Taffy Clayton, who Hi. was one of her vice chancellors. Taffy, you got the question. Hi, Taffy. Thank you so much um, for the introduction, Dean. So I've got a quick question for you. A lot of faith writers have had wonderful transitions into stage and screen in terms of their books. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you see that for the future for your work, mm -hmm. um, particularly because the faith community tends to engage in that mm -hmm. way? Right. I definitely see it. I definitely see it. It's something I see, but like I was telling before, sometimes things are for a certain season. Yeah. So I can't pursue like that bulldog as much as I want to. You know, I had all these plans laid out in October of 2012. In November of 2012, when I took that test, those, cha those plans changed. Um, so I definitely see it for the future. You know, I work a little bit toward it. You know, I'm reading little script books, and um, I have a friend, his name is Palmer Williams, and he's on like House of Pain. And, no. Yeah, House of Pain, he does some of the stage plays with Tyler Perry and things like that. So he's always like, T, you ready to roll? You ready to do it? I'm like, yes, yes. And I call him like, Tyler, I mean, um, Palmer, guess what? We've had a little change. You know, but seeing him move forward, you know, knowing that he knows I have the interest there, um, it makes a huge difference. So I definitely see it for the future. Yeah. Well, as an alum, to an alum, I appreciate you coming back to share an impression upon these students like this. It means more than you know. Oh, Thanks. great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, but I want to talk one thing before we go, just on leadership, because this is a series on leadership. Mm -hmm. And you started by saying you walked around CNN with that uh, internship and you didn't say, oh, I don't have drive for this. But boy, do you have drive. <laughs> I'm all sitting here. I'm not sitting at that computer. I'm talking about writing the book. I'm not sitting at the computer, right? You have a drive. Mm -hmm. And that's a leadership quality. Right. How would you describe the leadership sort of your piece of your life? You're a mother leader, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's clearly mm -hmm. important. You're a leader in the group, you're with your friends and your right. network. How would you define leadership for yourself and that's made the difference? Oh, how would I define leadership for myself? I think for me, the leadership part has been creating opportunities. Um, because even though you have those network of people, you have to create the opportunities that fit perfectly for your life. And when I couldn't find those things, I tried to um, create those things. And I tried to cultivate those things. And what happened was when people who were like mothers who wanted to do certain things, when they saw me doing them, I think they kind of started calling me, you know, asking, you know, well, what can I do? How can I do this? You know, can you help me? And I think just having, like you said, that drive, it kind of pushes you into being a leader. It pulls things out of you because you want not just to always lead people, but to have people walk with you. Like I shouldn't, I shouldn't lead you and then you, you can't stand alone. Like if I'm a good leader in this area for you, you should at, at some point be able to break away and fly on your own. So for me, leadership means cultivating other leaders, making great people great. Uh, that is a definition of a leader, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. You get to last, ask the last question. Last question. Um, I just wanted to know, like, I'll just say, what, like, what is your favorite book in your collection? Do you have a, a favorite? I know that's a really tough it question. Is. I get that question often, but my favorite book is all of them. <laughs> no, but um, for my books, I always tell people, they're like my children. Mm -hmm. I love them equally, but I love them all in a different way. Like, I love them for certain things that they are, mm -hmm. you know, certain lessons that they taught me. Um, so I love them equally, but I love them all in a different way. I can't really say I have an absolute favorite. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's the one, whatever I'm working on at the time, because that's what's at the top of my head. Um, but I love them all for what they've shown me, I think. Well, I can't wait to see one of the books on film. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because we all know what that means. you invited to the red carpet premiere. <laughs> and, uh, um, 
And I want to thank you for being the last in this semester's um, speaker series. We've got two already set for next year. Brooke Baldwin, another alum who's going to come back in the fall, who is now on CNN, and Mary Junk, who has been a huge supporter of the school over the years and has uh, been a publisher and a newspaper woman as head of the AP um, Association, a, a place that women didn't get to be able to run. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thank you really for joining us um, on this one. And I, I want to just leave uh, with two words that you said. Uh, well, uh, the phrase is pretty damn good, so I, wrong <laughs> word. <laughs> but, you know, bricks and mortar, click or order. That means you know, you know, there's your PR skills. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the words to me that you really shared with us today that have moved you in the different things is purpose and passion. And if we can sort of share with our students and with each other as staff and faculty and mm -hmm. colleagues, purpose and passion, the school's going to be better and our students going to be better because that's really what makes everything go. So that's thanks right. to Emma McCullough. And uh, thank you. we're really glad you came back. Thank you. I'm mm -hmm. glad to be back. Mm -hmm. <laughs>